Here are 10 things that I wish I knew before I started wedding photography. But first... Oh, that's good. It's chamomile tea for people who don't know. See that? It's a, it's a lens. But you didn't know that, did you? No. Because it's a cup. <laughs> Tip number one. Instagram alone just doesn't cut it. I remember when I first started my journey, I think it was quite common when you start anything in you know, this day and age, you start an Instagram account. And I think that's the most easiest thing to do because the barrier to entries are quite low. It's so accessible and you know almost most of your audience is on it. The thing with that is that everybody's on Instagram, right? So even people within the same field as you. Now this doesn't go to just photographers alone. You could be any type of vendor. You could have any type of business. You could have any type of interest or passion, something that makes you want to grow an audience. The reality is, is though that everyone is one dimensional. Gary Vee talks about it a lot within his podcast and YouTube videos. I highly recommend you guys to check out his content, but he talks about how everyone starts on Instagram and stays on Instagram. But I think there's more than just that. I think there's, there's a large component of the puzzle that's missing when people think to go, oh, I'm just going to start an Instagram account and take it from there. I think the more of a presence you have on a digital platform or several digital platforms, the more of an impact you're going to make and the more value you're perhaps going to provide with your potential client. Now, for me, I wish I got into just a little bit more earlier of different platforms at the time, not just Instagram. And I think it skewed my growth to a particular platform and it's all about planting different seeds in different areas where people can potentially find you. So if you stick to Instagram because it's easy, then great. But I highly recommend you to start researching other platforms that might be a bit more benefit to you. Um, don't just stick to the one type, otherwise you'll always be there. I'm on a roll, I feel so good. Tip number two, investing in yourself. I remember when I first started, I thought it was really important and, and something that I still do to this very day is to continuously learn. Now, this just isn't me as a photographer. This is just me as a human being. I love to learn. I love to grow and I'm passionate about a lot of different things in life. So one of the things that I thought made a really big impact uh, on my you know journeys thus far has been my constant need to invest and to grow. And we're talking about simple things like watching YouTube videos for hours, listening to podcasts when you're driving, talking to different vendors, talking to different creatives, looking at other people for inspiration, investing yourself in a, into a course or asking questions to people just a bit more senior to you. I think the, the benefit of actually investing into your craft, into yourself, into you as an asset means that you're now upskilling yourself to allow you know people to come to you because you are going to be that go-to guy or girl who's super talented in what they do. There's two aspects here. There's skill and there's talent. Talent comes naturally, I suppose, to people who are born gifted with those particular interests or areas where their strengths really play at hand. But then for others who have to work at it, that skill, and that comes down to hours and hours and hours of literally just beating on your craft, trying to get better it is what you actually do, trying to perfect your skill set. And I think that's really important. So constantly keep trying to invest in yourself by all means possible. Tip number three, having a workflow. I remember when I first started, I wasn't really too sure about what I needed to do or how to actually do it. I just thought photography, photos, give to a client. <laughs> if I look back at my journey uh, from when I started to where I am right now, a lot's changed. And we're talking about what happens before you even start beginning to take photos. Having a structure or a bit of a workflow is so incredibly important. And so I wish I got into a structured flow earlier. So towards the back end, I started paying a lot of attention towards CRMs and things that I would do to help improve the efficiency of my business as well as add structure uh, and add some sort of flow. And I think that's one thing that I just, I genuinely just didn't have. Like having a system in place is always gonna benefit you in the long run. And again, you don't need to be a photographer to take this advice on board. A large part of it can be applicable to any type of business, to any type of structure, to any passion or any type of investment that you guys have within your craft. I think it's important to have a structure or flow uh, and you're only gonna do that when you actually take your time out and research how it is to do things from a, you know an orderly fashion. Again, take with a grain of salt. This is something that I, I really appreciate and something that I wish I knew before I started running photography. Tip number four, work-life balance gets a little bit blurry. I remember Monday to Friday back then when I used to work uh, a corporate job I'd go from Monday to Friday five days a week then on top of that I'd have my weekend gigs and bookings and then on amidst doing all of that then it was going back to work Monday to Friday and then editing the, the weekends work and then you had emails coming through and, and you had consults that you had to do and you had more bookings and on top of that you had some sort of a social life and then you had deadlines for work and then just a whole bunch of different things just add up and before you realize that your work-life balance is pretty much gone I think it's also important to have your me time this year I got back into dance and I'm so passionate 
compassionate towards it. It brings me back some time for me to to just chill, to reflect, to just relax and not do something that has to do with photography 24 seven. So I think as much as, you know, running a business within the entertainment industry where predominantly most of your days are towards the weekends uh, that you work, it's about understanding that if that's now your working days, what do your non-working days look like and perhaps learn to differentiate the two. I think it's important to understand that if you want to do this sustainably, a large part of you has to be okay with having a separation between your work and your personal life. And the, the hard part about, you know, doing something that you love so much is trying to figure out where that differentiation is. And I think uh, that's the problem with passions becoming a career. So I think really reflect and think about what it is that perhaps brings you balance uh, and how it is that you maintain sanity amongst doing a lot of different things all at once. Tip number five, vendors are your new best friends. When I first started, I was really afraid of, of working with vendors because all of these guys are really established and I was shit scared. So for me, I, I didn't know makeup artists, I didn't know DJs, I didn't know venue owners, I didn't know all the cool, important components of what makes up a wedding on the special day. The reality is you're going to bump into these people time and time again. So one of the ways in which I realized my business grew was just having a great relationship with vendors. It was so important that I, I got onto, you know, great terms with makeup artists so that you fluently work with each other. Even people that you know that you're going to bump into on the wedding day can just make your life so much more easier if you know that this is a particular way in which they operate. Again, take it further. You don't know if that one vendor is going to recommend you to a potential client because they love working with you. Oh man, I'm getting so thirsty talking. I'm just so passionate. Oh, that's good. What was I going to say? Just thought I'd pause the video here for a quick second. If you haven't already done so, please like, comment, and subscribe. I'm trying to be a bit more consistent with this. I, I usually said at the beginning, and I'm going to put it in the middle, maybe. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to grow the channel. You know, I want to provide cool content. I want to know people are watching. <laughs> All right, let's get back to it. Tip number six, being smarter with your gear investment. Uh, when I first purchased my gear, it was a Canon Mark IV, and I bought the uh, Sigma 85 f1.4. And I thought, this is surely all I need. <laughs> oh, how wrong I was. I think this is common misconception amongst photographers or people perhaps just getting into their own business that buying the best gear is the best thing possible, which is incredibly wrong. It's not the gear that you have that matters. It's what you do with it that makes a difference. So I think dropping the misconception that bigger is always better is something that will help perhaps many of you getting into wedding photography or just your businesses in general, whatever they may be. I think definitely do a lot of research when it comes to what it is that you might actually need and can you get away with, with having perhaps not as the most expensive option and having something that does the exact same job, the exact same quality of work within a price range that's comfortable for you. Mind you, if you have the budget, oh, then go for it. That clearly doesn't matter. But I'm just talking about be smarter with it because four years down the line, five years, 10 years down the line, you're going to look back at what you invested within your business as far as gear goes. And some part of it, you might question to go, well, did I really need that? I know for a fact there's shit that I bought that I just don't use anymore. And that's okay. But I think for those of you who are about to start that journey, really, really, really think about it. Do I really need this? Uh, and if you do really need it, great. Well, then what's the quality that I can invest in that I know is going to future proof me for the next, you know, four to five, eight, nine, ten years. Number seven it's a really small wealth. Don't think because you rock up to a wedding, uh, you don't have the ability to influence anyone to potentially book you. That's really incorrect. I remember this one particular time I was at a wedding and uh, the bride and groom were obviously just chilling. I think I'd taken some shots and I already I saw another couple who were just sitting I think outside on this like balcony at one of the venues and I went up to them and said, excuse me, are you guys a thing? And they said yes. <laughs> Awkward if they were brother and sister, that would have been really, really weird. I ended up taking a photo of them because I thought they looked really cute. The lighting was great, the, the, the shot was great. I went up to them and showed them from my camera screen and they, and they fell in love with the shot. They're like, oh my god, that's so good, that's a great photo, can we have that? And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll grab your email. I remember grabbing their email and I think a couple of weeks after when the wedding finished, I ended up sending them that photo and conversation just started saying, hey, by the way, we're getting married. 
uh, that was a really great photo. Do you have more example of your work? And one thing led to another, a consult happened, we met for coffee and, and by that point in time, they're really happy to, to sign a contract. So you never really exactly know. The world is so small and if you live in a particular city that you've grown up in, chances are you're probably gonna bump into a lot of people who could also recommend you. Word of mouth is incredibly key. I think more so beyond social media marketing. So always understand that there's an opportunity to influence anyone uh, at any point in time. Tip number eight, being prompt is always key. Do you know how many times I get emails from people and it's say perhaps at 6.30 in the evening? Now, mind you, I could you know say no and respond the next day just because it's past 6 p.m., whatnot, but I reply within two minutes and the first comment after my response when they respond is, thank you so much for your really prompt response. I really appreciate that. That little 1% of just gratitude from a, a potential couple is all it really needs for them to go, hey, this person could potentially be a really great supplier. Uh, being able to respond promptly sets a precedence whereby if they have a question or query, you're gonna be their first go-to person because they know that that person is available. <laughs> and now again, be realistic, you don't wanna be responding at say 1 a.m. in the morning uh, and set that history. I don't think that's really a good idea. If you're awake, then fine, go for it. But I can't express now how important it is to respond within a certain time frame after you get hit up from any platform, by the way, not just emails. We're talking about DMs, we're talking about Facebook messages. Does anyone even use Facebook? I don't really even know. LinkedIn, we're talking about like any other platform that has an ability to communicate. If they ask you what your charges are, if they ask you what your services are, make it a point to respond to them within one to two hours. So definitely make it a point to try your best to be as prompt as possible. The next tip is to surround yourselves with fellow creatives. I can't stress enough how important it was to my growth when I realized that there were really talented people out there. People who had double, triple, quadruple the experiences what I had and people who could give me so much value and guidance. And I remember any opportunity that I got to meet someone who was more talented than me, I picked their brain or I asked for feedback because I recognized the value and the importance of growth and how detrimental that was for my success and getting better at my craft. So I remember, you know, I, I talked to so many different photographers. I asked them a lot of questions until this very day, if there's a photographer who's, you know, 10 times better than me or just someone who I know has something that I just can't do, I will ask them. And the final tip is be prepared to educate and guide your couples. Now, mind you, for someone who's starting wedding photography, if you've never really experienced weddings before, you're gonna learn a whole bunch of different things and you are gonna go to a lot more weddings than perhaps most people would for the obvious reason. Couples don't have the privilege of being at a wedding every single weekend to understand the flow of how it actually works. So the truth is, you're probably gonna be a bit more of a guidance to them than anybody else is ever gonna be. Now, yes, they could have a wedding planner or they could have a, a person who's already been married in their family. But the reality is, is that you as a photographer are constantly around the couple on their wedding day. So naturally ask yourself, if you were a couple getting married, who could be the best person to offer them as much value and, and give them tips on their wedding day to have a seamless wedding experience. If you haven't figured it out, the answer is gonna be you, by the way. So don't just treat it as a business. There's so many photographers I know who just use this line of work as a transaction, and I think that's where you know your ultimate passion or purpose perhaps has been a bit lost. And I think it becomes a trap where people fall into where they start treating a couple like another number. As a photographer, or even just as a human being, I always fundamentally believe the person who offers the most value wins. Your role as a photographer extends beyond just a person who takes photos. I think if you're the person who goes into a wedding and actually guides it from point A to B and ensures everyone has a great time and a very seamless experience, this then becomes a whole lot bigger. You now take yourself as the person who's just there to capture photos to now the person who goes and actually supports a couple, who actually cares about the couple, who actually helps them in planning their special day. Mind you, like, let's just break this down. A wedding day is a big deal. For wedding photographers, it's another wedding, absolutely. But for a couple, it's absolutely huge. It's, it's one of the moments that they've been looking towards their entire life. So naturally, there's an area where you might be a bit more experienced than they are in planning a wedding. If someone doesn't know about pre-shoots, educate them why it's important to have one. If someone doesn't know how much time it takes for bride and groom prep, tell them. If someone thinks that family photos take two minutes and there's 150 people, like literally every Indian wedding ever, <laughs> then educate them. It'll help them to realize that you stand out so much more than just 
XYZ person who takes photographs. Beyond that guys, that's top 10 things I wish I knew before I started wedding photography. If you are a wedding photographer just starting out, I highly recommend to, to really take your time and understand what these things are. You're gonna get to a point uh, where you look back in several years like I am and wish you did things differently. So don't be that one person. Beyond that guys, thank you so, so much. I hope you really enjoyed this video and I'll see you guys in the next one. Cheers.